Anybody that could stay with me for 20 years deserves an applause. So would you put your hands together for Monica? Amen. Are you ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Before we get into it, I want you to be in prayer. Uh, Ravonda Gleiser, she's a member of our church family, and uh, she passed away this week. And her funeral was this week, and Pastor Ron drove up to Lenore, North Carolina, and did the funeral last night. And uh, so we just want to be praying for her family. I know our, uh, our team is reaching out, and uh, many have made meals for the family and have called and checked in. And so we're just so thankful for all of you guys who have checked in on the family. And I wonder if we could just thank God for the team here that helps and uh, assists people during the times of tragedy like this. You know, we've got so many people around here who serve and nobody ever sees that. And there are a lot of people who, they just make a meal. And you would never really know until you're in that season of life uh, going through something that difficult, how much just a caring meal or a phone call or a letter or a card means. And so I want to thank our hospitality team for everything they do. And uh, Ravonda was an awesome woman. You know, she, uh, it's, so, it's so wild. She, she took the membership class and then, uh, through the process, we had tried to contact her and hadn't heard back from her. And I remember Rebecca getting an email one day from her, and she was so apologetic. She was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you quicker. I've been in chemo. And she's apologizing to us for not getting back to us. She's like, I want to get involved. I want to be a part. And as soon as this is over, I'll jump right in and, and do whatever I can. And uh, she had stage four ovarian cancer. And... Uh, it took her very quickly, 51 years old. Um, so today, you know, as you're in church, just just hug your, your family member a little bit longer. Um, make sure you pay a little bit closer attention because you never know. This might be the last Sunday some of us see each other. And uh, we need to make sure we take advantage of every opportunity we have when we come together, when we get together to love on one another and care for one another. We're gonna miss Ravonda, such a sweet woman. And uh, but she's in heaven with Jesus. Sad for us, but she's having the best day of her life right now. So, but anyway, just prayers for the family. If you would, grab a Bible and go to Luke chapter 9. And uh, we're going we're gonna to continue in this thought of our, I don't really have a series title um, for this. Uh, the thought is really connected to our vision, um, not just our overall vision of our church, belong, believe, become, or so that people far from God can be brought near to God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not really necessarily about that in particular. It always leads back to that. But it's the theme verse for us for 2017 and 18 that tells us in Isaiah 54 and 2, the Bible says there, God says to his people, he says, enlarge your tent, stretch your curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. Today I wanna take that that last part, because I believe that last part is actually the thing that everything in that verse hinges on, that strengthen your stakes, because if the stakes aren't strong, then the enlarging will actually be more of a problem than a blessing, uh, because if the wind comes or the blessing comes and the stakes or the foundation isn't, uh, isn't adequate to handle what God is going to do, then what's the point of the blessing? And so we've been talking about, we started a couple weeks ago, we've been talking about how to get ourselves ready for the more and the better that God wants to do in our lives. How many of you believe that God has more for you? He has better things in store for you. You might as well put your hands together because whether you believe it or not, he does. He does. There's more, there's better. And so we're just believing that and trusting that. And we're asking how... If that's what God is doing, then how can we prepare our lives to be in the best position to handle what God is doing? And I want to share a story with you today from Luke chapter 9. So Luke chapter 9, and we're going to go to verse 43. And maybe at the beginning it might not make a whole lot of sense, but I promise you it's going to, it's going to come together. Luke chapter 9, verse 43. This is what the Bible says. All they were amazed at the majesty of God. Jesus had just healed a young boy. So everybody is marveling and amazed at the majesty and the 
healing power of Jesus. But listen, but while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And watch this. They did not understand this saying. And it was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. And watch what happens. Jesus, because you, you got to catch the scene here. The, there's, there's a lot of chaos going on. This young boy has just been healed. People are marveling and praising Jesus. Jesus has, in the middle of all this, somehow turned to his disciples and had this private moment with them. And he said, I know you see all of this, but what I want you to focus on is the, these words. I want you to remember these words. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. It's a wild scene. And then, the, then the Bible says, after Jesus says this, they, they didn't get it. And so watch what happens next. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set, by, set him by him. And he said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, him who sent me, for he who is, listen, he who is least among you will be great. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Notice, Jesus is trying to make a point, and then they switch the topic. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him, for he who is not, he who is not against us is on our side. Verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up. This is a focused verse here. It came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Some translations say he set his face as flint. He made up his mind. He was determined to go. New King James Version says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And then he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned to them and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And everybody said amen to that. And then they went to another village. Today I want to talk to you about focus. Two weeks ago, we talked about two in, in first service, I think I got to three. In second, I think I finished it too. But we talked about two, three things, two to three things that we need to do to prepare our lives for the yes and the more of God. First one was availability. We talked about how any move of God began with an available person. God isn't, isn't asking for perfect people. He's asking just for available people. Will you say yes to God's call? And then we talked about accountability. And accountability is so necessary in the more and the better for our lives because no one in here can be 360 degrees aware of who they are. We need people in our lives to make sure we stay on track. And then we talked about sensitivity. We talked about being sensitive to the things of God, being led by the Spirit. And today I wanna to talk to you about focus. We might get past focus today, but I don't know. I'm so focused on focus that I don't know if I'll get to the other points today. But this is what I wanna to talk to you about today. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the honor of being in your house. You're so good. You're so great. We honor your name today. Thank you for your presence that we feel in this room. Thank you for our worship team that does such an excellent job of leading us in praise and worship. We give you glory and honor for everything you're gonna do and say in this place, in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Well, um, I have to let you know that uh, we got a dog, and uh, uh, I don't know why I said yes to this dog. I, uh, I think I was distracted by how cute he was and the giant tears in my daughter Aaliyah's eyes, and I said yes, and uh, Aaliyah ha had in her mind that this thing was going to be the greatest blessing 
that has ever come into our house. And um, up to this point, I'm trying to figure out when that blessing is actually going to happen. Because all it's doing is pooping and peeing all over everything. The other day, I lost my mind. Have you ever lost your mind? Like, it was one of those moments where I'm just glad I'm not, I'm not on a reality TV show. I'm just glad cameras are not following me around. Because if cameras were following me around, you would not be at church this morning. Because you would think that guy needs to get to the altar before he ever goes and preaches again. He needs Jesus worse than me. You would think that. I lost my mind. I went and, because he, he likes to do it on the carpet. So I went and every loose piece of carpet I could find in my house, I lost my mind, grabbed it, and made sure Aaliyah and Monica were watching as I yelled and threw it violently out the back door off into the grass in the backyard as the neighbors looked in horror as to what is happening to this man right now. It was, uh, it, was, it was proposed to me as a blessing, but all I feel is cursed. That's all I feel right now. I don't feel, I don't feel blessing. I don't feel that. And I, 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 I've talked to Lee about this because before I would allow her to get a dog, because I've had dogs in the past and I realized how much work they are, I kept asking Aaliyah, are you prepared for this dog? Do you know what having this dog in your life for the next 10 to 15 years, if dad doesn't kill it first, for the next 10 to 15 years is going to cost you? And she said, yeah, I get it. Like every 13-year-old says, yeah, I get it. But she didn't get it. She didn't. And this thing that was supposed to be a blessing has turned into a very difficult season in her life. And if you want to, you could pray for her this morning. She's struggling. She's not sleeping. It's like when we had these new babies and they keep you up all night. This, this little guy is, is a struggle. And, and, and I'm, it, it, it's made me think more and more about how I pray because God said he'd give me whatever I asked. The problem is, is am I prepared for the thing I've been asking for? Because it's one thing to ask for it. And it's one thing to think, man, that would be nice to have. But it's another thing to actually have to have it and steward it. So I'm wondering in this, this morning in this building, are, are we preparing for what we've been asking God for? You know, for 30 plus years, we've been asking God for some things and God has been doing those things and sometimes we've been prepared and sometimes we haven't been prepared. Can I tell you, we have grown nearly 500 people in the last four years and we weren't ready for that. We weren't ready for that. Behind the scenes, we didn't have the system nor the structure in place to handle that many people coming into a place looking for life, looking for purpose, looking for foundation, looking for a place, we weren't ready for that. And so we've been dealing with these growing pains and what maybe to some people on the outside looks like a blessing. Man, it's, a, it's incredible how much you're growing. Sometimes we're sitting on Tuesday mornings and it's that meeting morning. What are we gonna do with all these people? Is that too real? Y'all are like, I thought y'all had this. And you're, <laughs> I'm like, no, we ain't got this. <laughs> we're trying to figure it out. But you pray for something and then all of a sudden it comes and you're like, my God, I did not prepare for it. I didn't know it was going to be like this. And so I'm asking, God doesn't just say, hey, big things are coming. Hey, enlarge your tents. Hey, open up the curtains. Hey, stretch out wide. No, he says, strengthen your stakes. God says, whatever you're expecting me to do, faith doesn't just believe I'll do it. Faith prepares for the thing I'm about to do. And real faith knows that God does exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or imagine. So we understand that if God is going to blow my mind, then I need to go beyond what I think I need to go in my preparation. That's good. That is so good because we live in a world where everybody wants something, but are we prepared for it? Everybody wants to be married, but not everybody's preparing to be a spouse. Everybody.
everybody wants a house, but not many people are preparing to make the house payment. <laughs> okay. Man. Listen to this. Mark chapter 2, 21 through 22. Jesus says something very interesting here. He says this. He says, you don't take a new piece of cloth and put it on a old garment. Because if you take a new piece of cloth and you put it on an old garment, then what happens when you wash it and life starts happening to the garment, the new piece starts to shrink. The old piece is already shrunk. And then the new piece, because it was put on in its newness, begins to shrink and it pulls away from the threads tearing from the garment. And then he says this, he says, you don't take new wine and put it into an old wineskin. Because the new wine, as it expands, will burst wide open an old wineskin. So in other words, I'm asking God to do something new, but I'm, I'm making the necessary changes to prepare for what God wants to do in my life. Can somebody say amen? It's amazing, we ask God, God, do something new, but God's like, you refuse to change. So if I do something new, it's just gonna spill out all over the place. It's just gonna result in a bunch of torn garments. And God's saying, I wanna do something new, but you have to prepare you for the something new that I wanna do. Wow. So what do I need to do to take on a new blessing? What do I need to do to take on a new blessing? Now, before the dog came, we went and bought a, uh, a crate and some dog food. But the dog doesn't like the things we bought him to put the dog food in. So he just knocks it over and eats it off the floor. I just thought you just put him in the crate and you walk away. But no, he, he cries like, I didn't know dogs cried like tears come out. And when we get home today, he's going to be like, his whole face is going to be wet where he's been in his crate all day. And so, so there's a preparation level that goes just beyond, I bought a crate and I bought some cups for, to put the food in. I need to understand the ramifications of what comes along with the crate and what comes along with the food, you do realize when he eats and he drinks water, that means he. <laughs> so what do I got to do to take on the new blessing? The more and the better. Because blessing can become a problem if you don't prepare right. What is like, oh man, look at this new, this new thing I got to put on this. Oh, this new patch I got for this old garment, it looks cool, but as soon as you start to wash it, the patch begins to tear away because it's new, the garment is old, they're not compatible. As soon as you say, oh my gosh, this new thing that God is doing, just pour it in, God, do it in me, and God begins to pour it in, and you realize, oh my gosh, I'm not ready. I'm not prepared for this new thing that God wants to do. God, I want you to do something new, but very often the thing that God does new doesn't look like what you thought it was gonna look like, and so it comes in a package you didn't expect it to come in, and when it gets there, you're not ready for it. Matter of fact, sometimes it's not that just you're not ready for it, it's that you reject it, because it doesn't look like, but that's the, that's the thing, it's new. <laughs> if it's new, it doesn't look like something Old. And I think sometimes in church, we're trying to recapture an old feeling and wrap it in a new package. But God said, stop trying to recapture the old. Behold, Isaiah said, I do a new thing. Will you not perceive it? Or in other words, I'm going to do something new. Are you going to miss it? Are you going to miss it? Because the new comes, but you have to be new in order to receive it. Because what's, what good is a new job if you're the same person going into a new job? What good is a new marriage if it's just if you're the same person going into? What good's a new house if you take the same person into the new? What good's a new car? What good is a new anything? What good is more money if right now the money you've got is using you and you're not using it? So we're, everybody wants new, but are we prepared for new? So what do I got to do? What do I got to do? 
if, if I, would do, I would do this, but I'm afraid because I don't have an ACL in my left knee, I'm afraid I would just destroy myself. But if I were to jump off of this stage and start running back through this aisle, um, that would freak you out. It would not only freak you out, it would freak out our camera people. It would freak out our sound people. You know, people might start crying. People might start running. People might start thinking, this guy's really lost his mind. This dog has done him in. He is out of control. The one thing you would have to do is if I jumped off of this stage and started running up this aisle, everybody in here would have to readjust to see me. Because right now I'm up in front of you, so it's easy. Your head just kind of swivels back and forth or you look on a screen or you... But if I were to start running, even the cameramen who are very good at following me around, and I move a lot for a preacher. I do a lot of these things. <laughs> you know, even though they're very good at it, they would still have to readjust. They would have to refocus because I'm doing something they're not ready for. They're not used to, and it's new. If I would have come to church and said, hey, guys, at 10, 15 minutes into my sermon, I'm going to jump off the stage and run towards you. They would have been ready for that adjustment. But if I do it without letting them know, then they're having to readjust on the fly. Right? And so a lot of us refuse to make the adjustments necessary to see clearer. Okay. When, they, when, when Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible tells us that he left the tomb. He's not there anymore. What did people do? Even though Jesus said, I'm going to rise from the dead, they still went to the tomb looking for him. And when he wasn't there, they cried. Why? Because they had not adjusted their lives to the word he had declared. Is that making sense? And so what I'm saying to you this morning is a lot of you are crying over stuff because it, it's not where it was, it's not how it was, it's not what it used to be, but can I say something to you? He's not there anymore. You have to adjust the way you, the way you look, because if you keep looking the way you used to look, you're going to be crying, you're going to be sorrowful, you're going to be sad, and not realizing that God is actually on the move, God is actually alive. We're just not looking in the right places. See, a lot of you are sad, but you're looking for hope in the wrong place. It's not there. You go to the news to find it. Can I tell you, it's not there. You go to talk shows to find it. Can I tell you, it's not there. You go to worldly things and pleasures to find it. Can I tell you, it's not there. If you would readjust your vision... You would really see that God is moving. Listen, I know it's crazy out there, but if you would adjust your vision, you would realize that Jesus is alive. The spirit of God is moving. People are being saved. The world is not as, it's not as bad as you think it is. <laughs> Why? Because God is better than you think he is. <laughs> so I've got to adjust. Everyone ends up somewhere, but very few people end up there on purpose. So the first thing you have to do to readjust, to get refocused, is you have to choose a destination. You have to choose a destination. I'm just going to get super practical right here. Listen, even in your car, you go get in your car, your GPS does not tell you where to go unless you enter a destination. You cannot determine the path, you cannot determine the road to take unless you enter a destination. You have to choose a destination. Again, everyone ends up somewhere, but very few people end up there on purpose. You have to choose a destination. Jesus, Luke 9. What did the Bible say? It said Jesus set his face. He determined that I'm going to Jerusalem. 
Even in the few verses before, he told the disciples, this is the most important thing. The Son of Man, I've been preparing you for this. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of his betrayers. He told them, I got, I got to get to Jerusalem. I, I have to get to Jerusalem. Jesus has made up his mind where he is going. And because he's made up his mind where he's going, it determines his path and his focus. It determines his path and his focus. If you don't pick a destination, first of all, you will never know what to say yes to and what to say no to. Every good thing is not a God thing. Oh, one of the toughest parts about pastoring a church is that in this church, you've got over a thousand people, somewhere 1,300 plus people say this is their home, church. And in this group of people, there are many people who have vision for their life or a purpose in life or a ministry they would like to do. And so nearly every week, I have someone come to me and say, I want to start this new ministry. I want to do this new thing. Now listen, I, wanted, I don't want to discourage you. Listen to my heart. I don't want to discourage you if you want to come to me and say, I'd like to start this new thing. Just don't be offended if I say no, because I know where we're going. And if it's not connected to where we're going, then I know what I need to say yes to and what I need to say no to. And some of you need to get that determination about your life and your business. Not everybody that comes along and says, hey, we should do this. Hey, we should go there. Does deserves the opportunity to turn your focus away from where you're trying to get. So if you know where you're going, you know who and what to say yes and no to. That's good. That's so helpful. Because if not, I'll just, listen, if, if you don't know where you're going, you'll date anybody. You'll, you'll date the first thing with teeth, hair, and eyeballs that shows up on your front porch. Because you have no clue where you're going. And if you're a young person in here and you say, I'm going somewhere, God has a great call on my life, but you're connected to somebody who's not great, how do you think you're going to get there? Because unless two agree, Amos says, they ain't going to go anywhere. You cannot walk together even if you don't agree. If they're going in one direction and you're going in another direction, in other words, if you're going hard after God and they're just kind of limping along, you're going to carry them for the next 50 years and you'll never get to your destination. Now, you, you can say that's mean, that's awful. I'm going to say it because over 50% of marriages end in divorce. Somebody has to say, stop marrying just the first person who tells you they love you. They like you. You're beautiful. You're good looking. Don't be so desperate that you get attached to somebody that you're going to have to carry for the rest of your life. Woo! Some married people in here say, say it, preacher. Say it, preacher. So I, was, I was in Los Angeles just a couple of weeks ago, and I was having lunch with somebody. If I said their name, every person in this room would know who they were. They said to me, when you're preaching, I want you to do me a favor. I want to make sure that you tell young people they're in a marriage right now that's it's it's they're separated because he's going in one direction. He's going hard after God. And his wife doesn't really want a whole lot to do with the Lord. He said, make sure you tell young people not to marry somebody that's not going in the same direction when it comes to the Lord. This is a Hollywood elite person. Please. He said, please, if you could do anything, one thing that would really help our society, it would have helped me if somebody would have just told me. Don't marry somebody that's not going in the same direction as you're going. And, and somebody would say, well, I know the Bible says don't be unequally yoked and, and, and with unbelievers, but they're a believer. And so I'm just going to be a missionary for the rest of my life and just, just reach them for the gospel. You try that. Talk to somebody. Just take a second and talk to somebody that's trying to win their spouse right now. Talk to them about the tears they cry and the nights they wake up and how hard it is to get to church and how hard it is when they go home and that spouse mocks them and makes fun of them because they go to church and they're serving the Lord. And then think about that for just a moment and adjust. Adjust that course. Choose a destination and adjust the course according to the destination. My God, that's hard, but it's the truth. 
Because you'll date anybody, you'll take any job. You'll be three years into college, can't pick a major. Can't pick a, I, I just, I, I just don't, I'm just going with the flow. Enjoy that. <laughs> just roll in with the punches. Well then, let the punches of life, that's a way to live life, isn't it? Let the punches of life dictate your direction. That, that's the way to do it. Just let people push you around and tell you where to go the rest of your life. That's gonna work out really well for you, let me tell you. Am I being sarcastic this morning? Absolutely, I got a dog, okay? I'm losing my mind. <laughs> But somebody should have told this little girl the truth before she got that dog. I was too weak, but I'm not weak anymore. I'm saying it now, and I'm saying it loud, and I'm saying it proud. I ain't scared. Because <laughs> if you know the destination, even if the road gets blocked, you can recalculate the route. Right? Even when the road gets blocked, you can recalcul recalculate the route. A lot of people, they don't know the destination, so every time they run into a roadblock, they just turn around and go, go the other way. Uh, I was going to go this, but it was hard, so it was blocked. I couldn't get in, so. <laughs> I wonder what would have happened to the civil rights movement if Martin Luther King Jr. would have just said, oh, it's too hard. I got thrown in prison. Looks like it's not going to work out. <laughs> Nothing worth getting to is easy. If you don't come to a point in your pursuit of your destiny, where your destiny looks like it said, no, go away, don't come near me, I hate you, and still kept going after it, then you don't deserve it. If you're not willing to fight for it, then you don't deserve it. Some people get married and they're not willing to fight for their marriage. You know what? You don't deserve it. I'm feeling good today. <laughs> you don't. Because whatever, whatever you're asking God for, he's saying strengthen the stakes. Get yourself ready. Because if you're not ready, what you think is a blessing is actually going to be a pain in your rear end. I want to get married. God says, all right, go for it. I just want to be blessed. I want two, I want two to become one. Okay. That's not a painful process. <laughs> two people becoming one. That sounds wonderful. And we say it in wedding ceremonies like, and the two shall become one flesh. And we're like, yeah, sex. And God's like, no, that's like death to self, actually. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> let me let me let me finish let me finish up real quick, okay? Let me let me let me tell you why you have to pick a destination because this is the thing. When you aren't clear about the destination, you'll get caught up in three different distractions. And let me give this to you really quick. These are the three different distractions of a lack of destination. All right? You see it in Luke chapter 9 in the story where Jesus tells his disciples, this is what's going to happen to me. They're unclear. The Bible says they don't get it. They don't understand what Jesus is doing. They don't understand why he's going to Jerusalem. They're afraid to even ask him. Watch what happens. So they're afraid to ask. The first thing that happens is this. A dispute arises among them over who should be the greatest or who is the greatest. So immediately we notice that when I don't have a destination for my life, the one thing that begins to happen, the first thing that begins to happen is comparison. Because when I don't know where I'm going, the only thing I'm left to do is compare my journey with your journey. And I'm trying to measure up to you. And even though you're going somewhere else, I'm trying to live my life comparing my life to you. And I never meet that expectation because I'm not going where you're going. So comparison jumps in. When I'm not sure about the destination, comparison jumps in. Why? Why? Because this, this is what uh, Corinthians says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So the reason we compare is because we don't have an understanding about our own future, about where we're going. 
So all I'm left to do is compare myself with your journey. Comparison. So can I tell you, you're unclear about the destination if your life is full of comparison. Second thing I notice about it is this. <laughs> they, they get what I call Drake syndrome. Everything becomes about the haters. Like you ever listen to Drake? Some of y'all are like, you're so quiet in here right now. I don't know, who's Drake? What is Drake? Is that a, is that a soft drink that, is that a, uh, <laughs> Drake syndrome. I got a lot of enemies, got a lot of enemies. All these haters, they're trying to drain me of my, my energy. I'm so depleted because I got so many haters in my life. No, you don't. The president's got haters. You ain't, you ain't got haters. You ain't that big time. Like nobody, nobody cares about your tweets. You're not that hated. Like walking around, like everybody hates me. No, there's some people that everybody hate. We can name them. But not everybody hates you. Oh man, the haters. If it wasn't for the haters, I could really fulfill my destiny. Remember they said to Jesus, they said to Jesus, after Jesus corrects them in their assumption that they should compare themselves, they go, uh, they go, well, Jesus, there are these other guys out there and they're, they're, they're casting out devils, but I, I'm not even sure they're doing it correctly. I'm not even sure it's theologically accurate. When I don't know my destination, I'll get caught up in what everybody else is doing and thinking everybody else is the object of my frustration and I'll be trying to correct all of them not realizing that the problem is me. So I'm thinking my problem's my haters. No, no, my problem, I, it's not my haters. There's nothing anyone can say or do that can keep me from the thing that God wants to do in my life. Some of y'all still stuck because I said the president has haters. That's obvious people. <laughs> you see your face, oh my gosh, he did it, he did it, he did it. <laughs> He went there. I'm just saying, the guy, there's not a lot of people that like the guy right now. If you're that level, then you could talk about, man, I got some haters. But you ain't got that many haters. Obama had haters. George W. Bush had haters. His dad had haters. They had haters. Man, it ain't, it ain't that, you ain't got that many haters. Second Kings Chapter 6 is a really cool portion of scripture. There's a young uh, follower of the prophet Elisha, and he's, he's concerned because he goes outside, and Elisha has been basically predicting everything that their enemy would do, and they've come to get him. And the, the young assistant goes out, and he looks out, and he's like, oh, my gosh. He's like, Elisha, they have us surrounded. And Elisha says this. He goes, he goes, man, I, I wish you could just see that they're actually more for you than against you. And then he prays. He says, God, open his eyes to see. And then he looks up and he realizes, oh, my gosh, the thing that has us surrounded is actually surrounded by God himself. And if you could, if you could wake up and on a daily basis realize that, yeah, there might be people that don't like you, but who cares? They're surrounded. You might feel like they have you surrounded, but they're surrounded. So the thing that's surrounding you is surrounded by God. You're not in any trouble because somebody doesn't like you. You're like, but this person on my job, they're, all they're doing, even, even with Jesus, he had, a, he had a Judas, he had persecutors, and all they did was push him every time into a new level of glory, into a new level of purpose. Haters can't keep you from your purpose. They are designed to push you into your purpose. So we compare. We, we get Drake syndrome. I think everybody's hating. Let me tell you the last one here. Judging. When I'm not clear about my destination, I spend a lot of my time judging others and their journey. Because if I know where I'm going, I don't have time to waste, I don't have time to waste talking about where you're going. I, I don't have time to, to waste judging you on how you're handling your journey because I'm, I'm messing up mine pretty good. I'm trying to figure out mine. I'm recalculating at this very moment. 
That's the thing. Even about GPS system in your car, it can only handle one destination at a time. So, so judging. What, did, what happens next? So they, they ask Jesus, hey, uh, these guys, they're not doing it like we're doing it. Jesus says, don't worry about them. They're not your enemy. You're, you're, you're making somebody an enemy that's not even an enemy. And then they go on, they go into Samaria, and the Bible says that because Jesus was so focused on getting to Jerusalem, the people in Samaria did not receive him. Jesus wasn't worried about it. He just kept moving, but the disciples, they lost their mind because they weren't clear about the destination. They lose their mind. Jesus, they're not receiving you. Do you want us to call fire down from heaven and burn them all up? And you know the church is preoccupied with judging when all we want to do is talk about other churches or talk about how people aren't measuring up. There's a standard blessed God and they're not. I mean, you want us to call fire from heaven? And Jesus is like, no, guys, I didn't come into the world to do that. I'm getting ready to die for these people you're trying to burn up. I'm getting ready to bring into heaven the people that you want to send to hell. So those are three things that happen when we fall off destination. I ask you to bow your head with me if you would. Sometimes we lose, sometimes we've picked a destination but we lose sight of it because of the things that happen in life. And I think I'm here this morning for for three groups of people, people who need to give their life to Jesus, but I'm also here for two other groups of people, those who have not picked a destination and need to choose. And those who have picked a destination but feel really far off that track. They, they, some things have happened in life and maybe they've gone off track. And with your head bowed and your eyes closed as you're, as you're sitting there this morning, I want you just to determine which one you are. All of us are in one of those three spaces. We either need Jesus for salvation. We, we haven't even determined that we're going to heaven, much less where we're going in this life. But, so we need to make that determination. Or we're here and we haven't really chosen a destination. We're just kind of rolling with life, going with the flow, you know, rolling with the punches. Or we have chosen a destination and things have happened to make us feel like we won't reach the destination. And I'm gonna ask everybody to now stand. And as you're thinking about that, I want, I want you to hear one more story and, and I'm gonna get out of your way and let you get to your afternoon plans. There's an awesome story in Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 through 23, about a man named Peter. If you've been in church, we've talked about this a lot. Peter and the disciples are sent on a boat by Jesus. He says, hey, I want you to go to the other side. They get in the boat. They're going to the other side. The winds kind of come up. They're pushing against the boat. And Jesus actually comes walking on the water. And when they see Jesus, the Bible says they think it's a ghost. They think it's a ghost. So here is their savior, their teacher, their mentor, who they've been with walking on water. And they see him, but they, they can't see him. The waves and the wind are having some impact on that. And so they think, wow, this is a ghost. Some of these guys were fishermen. And so, you know, they would have, hold, they would have told ghost stories on the water. And so some of them think, oh my gosh, here it is. This is that moment. It's a ghost. But Peter does something very interesting. He, 
he, after Jesus, lets them know, hey, it's me, don't be afraid. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. Tell me to come out to you in the water. And Jesus says, come on out. And Peter steps out of the boat and he's coming to Jesus because this is the thing about walking with Jesus. As long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, you do what Jesus does. So when my eyes are on Jesus, I'm not, see, this is, we, we get it mixed up. We're trying to help, we're trying to make ourselves walk on water. And no, I walk on water as a result of keeping my eyes on Jesus. So I'm not trying to work up this ability to walk on water. I don't have to work it up. When I look at Jesus, when I focus on him, I do what he does. The wind and the waves come up. He loses focus. He begins to sink. Now watch this. Jesus immediately saves him out of the water. And they get into the boat. And when they get into the boat, the Bible says that everyone in the boat, so that's including Peter, Everyone in the boat begins to praise the Lord. Everyone begins to praise the Lord. This is, this is the thing that I, I, I want you to understand this morning. He set his destination. Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come. I'm coming to you, Jesus. Many of you have set your destination, but in the middle of that journey to be like Jesus, to walk towards Jesus, to walk towards the purpose that God has for you. Many of you have taken your eyes off Jesus, just like me, and we've sunk, and Jesus has rescued us, and he's brought us into the boat. But one of the things we fail to do sometimes is praise him. <laughs> sometimes we, he picks us up, and he puts us back in the boat and we just sit in the corner and we pout and we whine and we talk about how big of a failure we are, how, how we're just not good enough, we'll never do it, we'll never accomplish it, we'll never get to the thing that God has for us. But I love what Peter did with the residue of his failure still all over him. He's the only wet one in the boat and he still chooses to praise God. Can I tell you this morning, God isn't looking for a perfect per praise He's not looking for a perfect sound. Can I give you a prerequisite for praising God? Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. If you're wondering, am I supposed to praise God this morning? Go ahead and inhale and exhale. And I'll tell you, yes, you are. If you're breathing this morning, give God a praise in this room right now. Give him a praise with the residue of your failure still all over you. Woo! Moments removed from blowing it. And Peter says, I'm gonna praise him anyhow. Moments removed from letting Jesus down and, and embarrassing himself in front of everybody. He throws his hands up and he praises the Lord anyway. Because this is the thing, I refuse to allow shame to keep me from my destination. I refuse. So those, there are those that they don't have a destination. But, but for you that picked one, and it seems like I'm not getting there. Don't let the shame of your failure keep you in the corner of that boat while everybody else is praising Jesus. Go ahead and stand up. Say, how long do I have to wait before I can, after my failure, before I can come to church again? How long do I have to wait after my failure before I can lift my hands to God again? How long do I have to wait before I'll be accepted again? Can I tell you, there is no waiting period. I know churches sometimes put a waiting period and make you, there is no waiting period with God. Go ahead and praise him with the stain of what you did all over you. Because this is the thing, I would rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat talker all day long. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word. Today, if there's anybody in this room and you say, Rob, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to declare Jesus is Lord of my life. I need forgiveness of my sins. I need to be made right with God today. And I wanna believe by faith that he's gonna save my life today and do a miracle 
in me and cleanse me from all of my unrighteousness. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, just throw your hand up really high in the air, and we're going to pray a prayer together. One, two, three. Throw that up in the air. That's you. One, two, three. Throw it up. I see you. Amen. It's awesome. Awesome. Keep that hand up. Keep it up. Amen. I want to pray a prayer with all of you. Would you bow your head with me, and let's pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you came and you gave your life just for me. I give you my life today. Take all of me. Have your way. Use me for your glory. Thank you for coming into my life today. I love you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Come on, I wonder if we could put our hands together.